Hello! <laughs> Hi! Welcome to Tablet 2 of the Epic of Gilgamesh. The next uh, probably five or six episodes are going to be Tablet 2. should take about an hour for me to read, I think. Uh, so before I start reading, I thought I would summarize for you what happened in Tablet 1, because it was a few weeks since I've uploaded Tablet 1. So, what happened in Tablet 1? Well, there's this guy called Gilgamesh, and he's a pretty great guy. He's a really awesome guy. He's big as the sun, or what, what, what did we say? He was like, his, his stride was like three meters long. He's the king of Uruk. Gilgamesh is the king of Uruk, and so he's honored and venerated as the king of Uruk, but he's also doing something that's like really, really shitty. It's like, like so, so unbelievably shitty that we kind of have to cringe that this is in our mythology. <laughs> this is, this is humanity's dreams. What, 6,000 years ago? 4,000 years ago? So many thousands of years ago? This was a thing, at least that people told stories about, which is that, uh, you get to rape newlyweds. That's that's the king's right. When when a woman and a man are married in the city of Uruk, Gilgamesh was claiming his right as the king to deflower the maiden before the husband, uh, with or without her consent. Assuming without her consent, considering she just got married to someone else. Um, so that's really terrible. And the city of Uruk cries out to the gods, saying, Oh gods, we've got this wonderful, amazing king who happens to be raping all of our citizens. What do we do? And the gods say, Oh, here's what we will do. We will make a man, the equal to Gilgamesh, and we will bring them together, and then they will go on many adventures, and Gilgamesh will stop raping his city. This is what the gods think. So they make Ankadu. And Ankadu is a wild caveman, and he lives in the hills and eats with the animals and drinks at the well with them. And he does not know language, and he does not know clothes. He is a wild man. And a hunter sees this wild Ankadu, and he gets very, very disturbed. He says, what's going on? And, Ankadu, and, and, and the hunter goes, and he seeks the advice of his father or the gods. It's not clear which one. And they say, you should go to the city of Uruk, and, and uh, they will send Shamhat to civilize this Ankadu do wild man. And Shamhat, of course, she is the uh, temple priestess for the temple to Inanna, or maybe it's Ishtar. Ishtar and Inanna are the same goddess, just one is Sumerian, the other is Akkadian. Uh, all the names get jumbled together. She's, she's divine fertility. She's woman, divine woman. Um, and what's interesting mm, religious feature of the religions at these times is that there were priestesses who were like, like, like the Pope almost, but female. Uh, and I mean, not really like the Pope, but like with that kind of, of, of esteem, uh, or like a priest, a priestess, right? Uh, and they would, they would be in these fertility goddess, uh, shrines. So Shamhat was the, the high priestess for the temple of Inanna, and um, these priestesses were also prostitutes. So that's a very, um, a very different <laughs> kind of thing about <laughs> women depicted in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So you've got this, these, think about this, the, this, these two, two instances where we've seen women, or I guess three instances where we've seen women in the Epic of Gilgamesh so far, right? You've got Inanna, who's this divine goddess. Um, you've got Shamhat, who is the high priestess and prostitute of this goddess, and then you've got all of the female Uruk citizens who are being raped by their king. So these are your images... Someone knocking at the door? No. These are your images of, of female that, that the Epic of Gilgamesh gives you, that our, our oldest story gives you in the West. Um, so on the one hand, it's like terribly objectifying that like it's okay that this great king is raping his citizens and like even the highest priest in the world, highest priestess in the world is is a, a sex worker. But it's also like, wait a second, maybe maybe there is a kind of glorification of fertility and a glorification of sex and femininity in the abstract, uh, not not like a civil rights kind of femininity, but like a divine kind of femininity. Uh, that is being honored here, despite the profound sexual violence. Um, and that's uh, an interesting tension in this story. Uh, so anyway, Shamhat, who is this high priestess of Inanna, she goes into the, into the hills uh, and she finds Ankadu 
and uh, she seduces Ankadu, and they have they have sex for six days and seven nights. Actually, I think it says that Ankadu is erect for six days and seven nights. I'm pretty sure that's what it says. So anyway, uh, Shamhat like teaches Ankadu the ways of man by seducing him, because after after the six days and seven nights, he can no longer communicate with the beasts. Uh, he's ashamed that he's naked. It's 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 the same kind of thing as the fall in the Old Testament. This is a precursor to the Old Testament story of the fall. Um, and you again, you see this thing of like the woman is the is the seductress, uh, but also she's the civilizer, right? So Ankadu isn't necessarily in some bucolic garden of Eden. He's he's a wild man in the wilderness, and then she's he's he's transformed by Shamhat, and. Uh, now he's on his way to, to visit Gilgamesh to convince him to stop raving his city. Um, so that's where we left off. Uh, but So I'm just going to dwell a little bit more on this civilizing aspect of Shamhat, because that's, it's really interesting. Um, you know, it's like it's a Beauty and the Beast story, right? That, that, that's like literally, if you watch Disney's Beauty and the Beast, it's the same thing. Like this man is this brutish, brutish person outside of civilization, and then Belle comes and she, you know, falls in love with the beast and he turns into a beautiful prince, right? So this is the same thing with Ankadu, is, you know, he's this wild beast man, and then Shamha comes and seduces him, and then he turns into Gilgamesh's companion. Um, so, so again, the, there's this, this pressing question of like, what is the role of women in the evolution of society, you know, the civilization of man. What is the role of women in the evolution of society, and what is the role of women in, in our society today? Like, can we still attribute civilizing characteristics, domestic characteristics, to the feminine principle? Is that something that we ought to be doing? Um, or is that just a gender binary that's not worthwhile? Uh, there's a lot of gender questions uh, that Gilgamesh raises, and also this question of the fall. Um, those were the two themes that I brought up in at the end of the last video. So it's like this this question of gender roles and the question of the fall are are really tied up into each other because you know when we when we were civilized we fell, we you know we lost our ability to run fast and and be with the beasts, uh, and it was woman's fault, but kind of, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> um, that that maybe what it means to be human has become more feminine, maybe you could say. You know, the, the, the feminine impact on on humankind, mankind, is to civilize it. Um, so that means we're all more feminine now. Uh, I'm rambling. Um, that was a summary of Tablet 1 of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is raping his city. The gods create Ankudu to become his best friend so that he stops raping the city. Ankudu gets seduced by Shamhat and convinced to come to the city. And tablet two, next video, because I've been talking for a while.